Good afternoon, folks. My name is Bill Cantrell. I am here to kind of get things kicked off. We're going to be having a number of folks joining. We've had, so far, we've had on the registrations over somewhere almost 400 folks so far registered. Plus, I'm still working on getting the Facebook Live and also getting uh, the YouTube Live up. We're going to be going having a great day with Jim. Jim's a, an awesome educator as far as from a perspective of airway management. Uh, I've taught with him uh, a number of places and he's always, you know, a pleasure, always come away learning something. It's been my honor to have learned from him as well as consider him to be one of the uh, mentors that I have. Uh, as a note on the screen, we'll, uh, if you do tweet on this or hashtag anything. They hadn't done much. Try to use the hashtag on these uh, salad live. So just hashtag salad live. Uh, we'll also end up, uh, we'll have some information coming up as we go through a little bit really quickly about who we are. Northwest Health Services uh, kind of sponsored this. I've been teaching with Jim and with the whole COVID-19, we really hadn't been able to, to get out and, and do training education. So. This was a way we could do, hopefully this is gonna be the largest ever salad education program. Um, our organization is a medical training organization uh, specializing really in a lot of the alphabets that everybody has to uh, deal with as far as we've got uh, everything from ACLS, PALS, BLS, Stop the Bleed classes, as well as uh, we've got difficult airway management. We do on uh, site training as far as salad. We do some point of care ultrasound, vascular access, and our biggest one now lately has been the protected code and airway where we uh, train folks on staying safe, making sure their PPE works. The one that we're really most proud of recently is our virtual trauma nursing uh, core course. It's TNCC and ENPC. We're offering those pretty much online almost 24 seven. So. We've had a lot of interest in that. We're seeing a lot of folks that are, we're running right now, three to four classes a week, soon to be five. When we look through some of the companies that have really helped make this possible, they're the ones that um, have great products and have provided great support. Um, the first one up there scores is one that you'll see some of the catheters used in suctions, uh, Seven Sigma mannequins, probably, the most high fidelity, best mannequin we've ever used. We've got, um, we're switching our training center over to all of their mannequins. And then for UEScope, where we've got, with all these manufacturers, we've had a really good uh, relationship with. Uh, I would still promote their products, even if they didn't, you know, provide us with uh, free disposables and things like that. Don't tell them, but we really would because we believe in the product so much. Uh, during the uh, presentation, if you have any questions, comments, I'll put my information up there afterwards. Uh, we'll probably send you just a single email after the conference, just with some links to these folks, so that you know if you like what you see, you can contact them, get more information. We're not going to spam you or, you know, become the, the thorn in your side, the medical equivalent of, you know, the call that you get about your car uh, warranty online. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jim, and I'm going to let Jim do what he does. Okay. Guys, hey, it's going to take me a moment to adjust to this. So you're handing it over to me, Bill? Yep. You're now the host. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. I'm trying, going to try to get to my slideshow here. Guys, my name is Jim Ducanto. I'm an anesthesiologist. I work in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Been here since 1997. Um, it's um, my first day of uh, training in anesthesiology. My favorite professor said something very uh, important to us all. We're all sitting in a conference room and we've got white coats on. And we're sort of like halfway between, oh, we're great. And oh my God, this is going to be really intimidating. And Dr. Gunzuri, Hal Gunzuri, he said, uh, I'm going to say something to you that's very, very uh, important. I hope you never forget it. It's very difficult to kill a breathing patient. And uh, he said, uh, he set me on my path towards uh, really trying to master airway management. <clears throat> and I'm sitting in, sitting in front of you here today, uh, hopefully sharing some of the things that I've learned along the way. 
Uh, let me launch into a slideshow. The slideshow you're about to see was actually designed for the education of a local uh, suburban uh, EMS department within um, suburban Milwaukee. Bill, can everybody see this now, the slideshow? Am I getting it up there? No? Hold on, let me see, I gotta share uh, the screen. You've still, sh you still gotta share yeah, your yeah, screen, share. Jim. Yeah, hold on one second. So, I'm sorry, everybody. This is the first time I'm ever actually doing this with Zoom. So I'm not gonna be that good at it. There we are. Okay, now I gotta go share screen. Negative. Let's go back to this, back to this. And for some reason I lost my toolbar to share my screen here, Bill. So give me a moment here, everybody. How did I lose that? <laughs> oh, I see. Okay, Zoom. Here we are. Forgive me, everybody, and share screen. Um, continue and slideshow and share. And here we go. Let's try this again. Very good, Jim. Okay. All right, everybody. Thanks for being patient. Um, so, as I say, I'm Dr. Jim Ducanto. Um, this slideshow is intended for uh, emergency medicine and pre-hospital providers. <clears throat> I call this slideshow uh, the missing link in trauma airway management. Uh, conflicts of interest, I do have um, a couple of uh, products on the market that uh, do benefit from this project. I've invented a suction catheter and a training mannequin, and I'll show you the training mannequin and the suction catheter during the presentation here. So uh, what is SALAD? It's um, when we're using the suction catheter um, preemptively, number one, we're using it preemptively instead of simply waiting to see if we need to suction, we use the suction right away. We also physically use the suction as a tool to help you do the laryngoscopy or help you put in the supraglottic airway or help you put in the, the oral pharyngeal airway. I'll show you uh, some pictures of that during the presentation here. This is addressing some factors that I believe uh, cause failure or first pass success during a tracheal innovation or supraglottic airway insertion. Um, I'm going to show you some literature here as well. Um, there's a paper I'm going to show you next that shows that the top two causes of the first pass success failure in the study that I'm about to show you were essentially airway contamination uh, and uh, swelling of the airway. This is the uh, paper from, um, and if you guys were, um, know any of the people in uh, airway management, I, if you can see my cursor arrow here, John Sackles is very well published in emergency medicine airway management and his colleague, uh, Jared Mose here, uh, this is uh, this, uh, John Sackles is his mentor. Uh, they're doing some very high quality publications in airway management as it regards emergency medicine and uh, ICU. They did a uh, prospective study over four years of 906 consecutive patients in their intensive care unit. They used only video laryngoscopes to intubate these patients. They used either a GlideScope or a CMAC. And um, they took their data down and what they tried to analyze was um, um, what stopped them from being success, completely successful. The top two reasons why they uh, were not successful on the first attempt were blood in the airway followed by airway edema. Um, and these are the two major factors that SALAD wishes, uh, hopes to address. SALAD, by the way, in case you don't know the acronym, stands for Suction Assisted Laryngoscopy with Simultaneous Airway Decontamination, or SALAD. The paper broke down the causes of um, uh, that contributed to the failure of uh, intubation in those cases. And as you can all see, they all basically relate to either airway uh, secretions or contamination or uh, limited space in the mouth or hypopharynx. So salad is intended to essentially manage the, in addition to suction, it's intended to help you manage the physical space. I'll show you some videos to, and I'll show you a live demonstration to demonstrate this. We're trying to limit the negative effects of edema of the airway, uh, poorly positioned patients, which causes a short neck, by the way, if you properly position a patient, the neck gets a little bit longer. Um, 
obesity, limited mouth opening, large tongue for pharyngeal size. By definition, that's a male and potty three or four and cervical immobility. Salad is also there. Its primary purpose is to manage the airway contaminants. So uh, how do we know that this works in the real world? I have a pal who is a medical director of a uh, moderately large EMS system in uh, Texas and I uh, periodically get uh, information from him from his registry. He's keeping a registry of all the airways done in his department and his medics are passing back uh, very positive um, uh, reflections on how the technique is really helping them manage the airway. And in that service, they're using primary, they use the King Vision video laryngoscope exclusively. Uh, this is just uh, one from one of the, re the registry that uh, my colleague uh, uh, gave me. Um, it just gives you an idea about the type of um, airways they're facing. Uh, the um, patient was indoors, positioned on floor, King channeled uh, video laryngoscope utilized, difficulties encountered, blood, vomit, secretions in the airway, um, other problems, tube almost too large, but still passed. Uh, they're also trained to use airway animating catheters or rugies and was the attempt successful. Um, another um, example on the bottom right here, um, um, excuse me, same case. Um, is there anything that you would tell others facing a similar situation? Suction, 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 bury that suction. And that's part of the salad technique is to bury the suction to the left of the video laryngoscope. I'm gonna go through a slideshow now that shows the salad technique in pictures in a mannequin now. We're gonna show a contaminated airway and this is a, um, a Berman oral airway. I'm gonna be placing this oral airway with suction assistance now. I'll begin, uh, I'm gonna be using a, a large bore suction catheter. This is the Ducanto suction catheter from SCORE. I'm gonna start out by holding, you're gonna see that I'm holding the suction catheter upside down. I don't hold it in the normal fashion that you were taught to hold the suction when you're assisting a surgeon or uh, some type of a surgical procedure. I hold it upside down, basically in the same contour as you would hold a laryngoscope. I'm going to evacuate the oropharyngeal airway contaminants all the way to the po uh, back of the pharynx. And then I'm going to push and lift the, I'm gonna push the tongue into the floor of the mouth and distract the mandible inferiorly to ease the insertion of the oral airway. There we have that. Now during mask ventilation, if the mask ventilation becomes difficult, the procedure would be to pass the suction catheter, either a flexible or a rigid, uh, along one side or both sides of the airway to decontaminate the hypopharynx. I didn't show that in pictures here. Oh no, I, I'm going to, Never mind. So here we go, we're gonna decontaminate this contaminated airway. The oral airway stays in, it doesn't come out, it stays in because it's gonna hold the space open to allow me to decontaminate it. Don't take that oral airway out, leave it in. That is if, of course, they're not rejecting the oral airway. And that's obviously uh, quite deeply placed in the mannequin. We're gonna show this for the insertion of an eye gel now. Um, this could be used with a King airway as well. Start with a contaminated airway. Uh, the one change I would uh, do to this is um, I'm actually now teaching to um, put the suction into the left hand. Uh, so th the technique will be more familiar to you as if you were holding a laryngoscope. But it will, I can put eye gels in left-handed. I'm an anesthesiologist, so here we go. I'm going to decontaminate the oral pharynx and hypopharynx, and I'm going to begin to push and lift. And by lifting, I mean I'm pushing and lifting the tongue off the posterior pharynx. This is gonna open the space to allow me to push the um, supraglottic airway into, into battery, as it were, into, into its uh, final position. As the supraglottic airway reaches its final position, the suction may actually be physically obstructing its final seating. I'm going to actually withdraw the suction as I, um, a little bit as I seat the airway. Now I'm gonna show, this is a, um, something that I would want you to practice in simulation before you do this in actual practice. I would uh, counsel you to get someone to set up a, a salad um, simulation for you. We're gonna deliberately contaminate the airway and contaminate the supraglottic airway. We're going to decontaminate this completely with a rigid suction catheter. You can of course use a flexible suction catheter, but this is a 
a, a recommended technique that you investigate. I'm not going to tell you to go out and do this today. But um, as we know, um, airway contamination can overwhelm uh, normal Yankauer suctions as well as flexible suctions. And then if you need to use a large bore suction, uh, this, is a this is a suggested technique. I'm going to begin simply by suctioning the uh, contents in the 15 millimeter connector. And then I'm going to run that suction down alongside that superglottic airway. As I get the tip of that suction to the hypopharynx, I'm going to withdraw that superglottic airway. This is an eye gel. You can't do this with a king tube. You'd have to deflate it to do that. I'm going to withdraw the eye gel slightly and pass the tip of the suction pat over the top of the bowl of the supraglottic airway, suction the perilaryngeal area, the periglottic area. I'm then going to swap the devices by reinserting the eye gel while I withdraw the suction to give the uh, eye gel the space it needs to re-engage with the glottis. Go back. So I'm pushing it back in now as I'm withdrawing my suction, okay? So from here, we're gonna go into uh, laryngoscopy. The salad technique was um, created I'm, uh, uh, to really assist um, uh, laryngoscopy, but it became clear to me that um, uh, it works with basic life support maneuvers as well. But I'm gonna go ahead and show you now a picture stream from um, uh, using a, a Macintosh laryngoscope. We're going to start by holding the suction catheter upside down like we did with the other um, simulations. Suctioning the oral pharynx as completely as we can. And as we begin to insert the laryngoscope, we lead with the suction, lead with the suction. And then I'm going to begin to push the tongue into the floor of mouth and distract the mandible inferiorly. This is going to give me a lot more room to place that laryngoscope, especially if this patient has a very large tongue for pharyngeal size. So here we go, we're going into the posterior pharynx now. There's our uvula. We're coming around the base of tongue. The suction's leading the laryngoscope. The tip of that laryngoscope is now in the vollecula. You can see the epiglottis uh, underneath the tip of the laryngoscope. I'm exposing the larynx now. Now in cases of uh, uh, gastrointestinal bleeding or trauma, blood can re, even though I've decontaminated this airway, blood can reaccumulate in the posterior pharynx and underneath the larynx. This is one of the um, major reasons why first pass success is not achieved in uh, uh, traumatic airways and, and GI bleeds. I'm going to leave the suction in during the intubation, but the suction is in the wrong position to allow me to uh, place a tracheal tube. It's completely in the way of tracheal tube delivery. I'm gonna to have to take the suction out and begin the procedure that we call the salad park. We take the suction out and we pass it to the left of the laryngoscope, whether it's a standard laryngoscope or a video laryngoscope, we pass it to the left. This pushes the laryngus, uh, the, the suction out of the path of tracheal tube delivery, gives me the ability to deliver a tracheal tube un, unhindered. Before I deliver the tracheal tube, because obviously you may be concerned that we're putting way too darn many things into the patient's mouth, I need to actually double check that I have room to place the tracheal tube. As you look at to the right side of that laryngoscope, it looks like there's quite a bit of space, but I am going to make darn sure that I have the room to deliver that tracheal tube. I'll do that by putting my index finger into the mouth alongside the right margin of that laryngoscope blade. I call this the salad poke. I'm gonna shove it right in there all the way to the knuckle. This is going to help me move the laryngoscope subtly more towards the midline. If the tongue is hanging over the laryngoscope blade with the pad of my index finger, I can actually push it to the left of the laryngoscope and open up an even bigger channel for tracheal tube delivery. One of the big problems with video laryngoscopy is you can see the larynx, but you can't get the tracheal tube in. I believe that if you use a salad poke maneuver, you can uh, be more successful by giving yourself the space to deliver the tube. There we go. Now I'm gonna hold the tracheal tube. Uh, I'm using a GlideScope stylet. You're seeing me holding it all the way at the top. And there's our tube delivery and there's our removal of stylet. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to show a couple of videos and then I'm gonna go to a live uh, session here with a different camera. 
in this age of COVID-19, um, we're concerned that we have, um, well, we're, we, th one of the things we're concerned about is we now have a threat that we cannot see. That is a huge thing to be worried about. When you are worried about something you can't see, well, I mean, I know we're, we have to, you have to obviously be wearing the proper protective gear to do this job. I set up a simulation where the mannequin is going to exhale a stream of, um, of mist that's created from a, um, created from nebulizers. And I mixed um, diet tonic water, uh, which fluoresces on contact with ultraviolet light so that we can see it better. And we're gonna take a look at this now. So let me go ahead and launch this video here. We are demonstrating a simulation of the exhalation of respiratory droplets from a seven sigma mannequin connected to two nebulizer units flowing at 30 degrees per minute. We are seeking to investigate in the simulation setting simple and effective techniques to reduce airborne contamination of the clinical workspace using handheld suction and the elements of the salad technique. By bringing the catheter closer to the patient's mouth, you can see a dramatic decrease in the amount of vapors being released from the patient. And as we advance that even further in the airway, simulating our suction techniques, it's further controlling that vaporized mist from forming and being discharged by the patient. Again, utilizing up both the patient's mouth, we can do our laryngoscopy. As we work our way down our tongue, the upper glottis there. By keeping this catheter from being pinned in the esophagus like we normally do, even the hypopharyngeal space, we can continue to control some of that vapor release from being discharged up into the incubator's space. So by pinning that in the hypopharyngeal space, we can get a good visualization for intubation. Go ahead and pass our tube. So the tube is in, the player cup. Now, virtually eliminating the mist. All right, the basic salad technique. Uh, so again, especially in pre-hospital environments, about 25% of the patients we encounter in cardiac arrest are going to have a soiled airway. So finding a way to effectively manage those airways and get that quick first pass success in our intubation is even that much more important. So to lead off, a lot of people have seen this before, but to lead off, we're always going to go to the airway with a suction catheter first. Holding the canto catheter, kind of back to the traditional uh, yank power catheters, overhand grips, we have a lot of force and control with it if needed. We're just going to open up the mouth, we're going to lead into the suction, suction down as far as we can see, we're going to catheter back and forth. At this point, we need control of that tongue, pull it up against that mandible, and then we can actually drive that mandible calmly and anteriorly to ease insertion of our laryngoscope. Once the laryngoscope is in the mouth, we can easily suction our way down to the airway. We can visualize the vocal cord and make sure there's no secretions inside the bottom opening. And once it's all clear, we'll just quickly pin that catheter. Now in the esophagus on the left-hand side of the blade, so we can free up the right side of the blade for tube placement. Using the old technique that we can insert our index finger in the mouth, push our blade, and the suction catheter all the way to the left face of the mouth, left side of the mouth. So we have plenty of room. Get our endophagal tube into the mouth, place it in the airway, and completing our intubation. 
Now we know that that soil was there way when we started, so we have to assume that some of the uh, aspirate probably made its way down into the trachea. So the first thing we want to do at this stage is suction out our ET tube by inserting our indwelling suction catheter here. And then disconnect our suction from our suction catheter, our rigid suction catheter. And as you can see, there was quite a bit of secretions and emesis inside that ET tube. Once that clear, we can go ahead and hook up to our oxygen source and begin ventilating the patient either with BVM or through a ventilating device. Okay, very good. Um, I have a second video to show, but I'm going to skip it because I think I'd like to go to the live session here, Bill. So I'm going to go ahead and share, go to a different share screen thing here. Go ahead and just shrink this up here. Sharing is paused. Okay, resume new share. All right. Hey, Bill, how do I get this thing to come back to just uh, video? What do I do? Here we go. Resume share. Let's see here. Here we go. No. Trying to switch cameras here, guys. Sorry about this. All right. Um, pin video, hide video. After all, after we've all been stuck at home for so long, you would figure I'd be a lot better at this. Okay, hold on here. I am going to. All right, there we go. Let's try this. Okay, very good. All right. What I'm gonna do now is the live demonstration here. Activate my suction. And we're gonna use a variety of devices here. We're gonna be using a CMAC and then we're gonna be using a channel device. I have a vivid track tonight, we'll use a vivid track. I'm going to start by contaminating this airway. Nice. Airway contaminant. Here we go. Okay. Now we all uh, know that the Yankauer catheter has been the standard for um, uh, ever since we were in training. Uh, this is actually a, a metal Yankauer, and this is a uh, Ducanto catheter. Uh, Ducanto catheter is uh, a large bore suction. And what you can see is that the uh, Yankauer has what's called a rosette tip. The Ducanto just has a straight open tip with some holes on the side. And if in the event that it catches tissue, it won't uh, firmly fasten to the tissue. I'm going to start with my suction uh, held, uh, I don't know if you call that underhand or what. And I'm going to get my tracheal tube out here. I'm going to be using a glide scope stylet. And I'll begin by entering the airway. And I'm going to put my head on the top of the push and lift a little bit. Let me redo the light here just a little bit so you can see a little bit better. Get this light in here. A little bit better. Make this a better demonstration. Recontaminating airway. All right, there we go. Now I'm going to push and lift like a little push and lift. Push and lift. So allow me to put the laryngoscope in. As I'm entering the airway, why do I want to leave the suction in the airway in this in this case? I'm going to show you why in a moment. I'm going to recontaminate the airway. 
by pushing on my pump. And right now my suction is serving as a sump pump to maintain hypopharyngeal decontamination. I cannot deliver a tracheal tube while it's in, uh, it's in the way of delivery. So I'm going to salad park it to the left of the video line is still. And now I'm going to show you what it looks like when I recontaminate the airway. It's maintaining a decontaminated hypopharynx. What do I want to do? What do I want to do before I deliver the tracheal tube? I'm going to do that whole salad poke thing. Put my finger in. I'm going to make sure that the tongue is not hanging over the side of the blade. I'm going to make sure that I have room to get the tube in. This is also going to potentially reduce the side effect from the GlideScope stylet of piercing the right palatal glossal arch. That's one of the most frequently reported complications with the GlideScope stylet. I'm going to hold this overhand and I'm going to drop my elbow as I put the tube in. As I get the tube in, this is made so that you can deliver the, the tracheal tube and withdraw the stylet without assistance. In this case, I'm doing a crappy job of it. Let me get this tracheal tube in a little, little bit deeper. Not being very kind to me, is it? Eh, it's not a very good job. And I'm going to get this tube in anyway. Yeah, not my day for this thing, is it? Okay, I'm going to be using a different stylet now. After I complete this airway, I'm going to show you an example of a new stylet. It just doesn't want to go in there. Okay. I'm going to use a different stylet called a J stylet. This is from a company that's marketing this Sharni Anesthesia. I'll show you the package here at the end of the uh, lecture. This has a small bougie-like protrusion on it. And actually, it's uh, quite a useful tool for uh, direct and video laryngoscopy if you're using um, a non-channel blade. Let's recontaminate this airway. Go ahead and begin airway decontamination. Push and lift. Put in my laryngoscope. Decontaminate. Periglottic area. Salad park the catheter. Salad poke. And now this J stylet makes everything a lot easier, as you can see. And I can even take my own stylet out. Um, the one thing I'm omitting from this demonstration is suctioning the tracheal tube. I apologize, but I do abdicate that. Let's go ahead and switch gears and move over to our channel device. Oh, I almost forgot. I think you probably want to see bougie delivery. We need to get that out now. Let's do a bougie. So for a bougie, I'm going to show you something called a uh, a modified Kiwi or a Kiwi D grip. We're going to actually lock the um, tail of the bougie through the Murphy eye there. This is going to allow me to hold the bougie um, in this fashion. As a matter of fact, I can hold several things in my hand at once if I do this. We can handle this airway. And there we go. Push and lift. Close to your parents. Salad park. Salad poke. And now I'm going to deliver the bougie leading 
And as I place this within the trachea, I can release the tail of the bougie and place the tracheal tube with a leftward twist. My goal is not to achieve hang up with this bougie. It can occur, but you, you can prevent that if you are careful about how deeply you place the bougie before you deliver the tracheal tube. The bougie is now removed. The tracheal tube is cuff is inflated. The tracheal tube cuff, uh, is suctioned. Let's go ahead and use a channel device. I was going to use my um, um, King Vision, but I uh, unfortunately I was unable to find it. So we're going to use a uh, a very good one. This is a vivid track. This is uh, actually a product of Palo Alto, California. The peculiarities of tracheal tube delivery with this device require, in lieu of using a bougie leading uh, through the tracheal tube, we use the straight portion through the tracheal tube for more success. We're going to put that there. And then I'm going to curl this backwards. I have some control. Let's recontaminate this airway. Give you a demonstration. And then the last demonstration I'll perform is with a alternative suction device. So here we have a contaminated airway. I'm going to begin decontaminating it. And I'm going to push and lift. Place the vivid track into the hypocarps. This is a USB single patient use device. Run on a tablet computer. I can advance the tube, and if I need the help of the bougie, I simply advance the bougie. Get under that epiglottis. And advance the tube. Beautiful. Now the device almost looks like a big oral airway in the mouth. Um, so this is the salad technique with a channel device. Lastly, I want to demonstrate the use of a portable non-electric suction device. And then we'll stop for questions. I'm going to demonstrate a gadget that was created recently as last year from a, uh, an existing medical tool and we contaminate this airway and I'll demonstrate it now. In the early 1990s, there was an American corporation who created a device called a Suction Easy. The Suction Easy utilizes a uh, device that looks like a turkey baster bulb, a, um, a valve for evacuating air if the air bag fills up there and has two one-way valves in it, one inside the bulb and one inside the bag. This allows you to squeeze the bulb to expel any contents of airway of contamination in the bulb into the bag. And when you release, that valve closes and this valve opens. So what you're going to see me do is the salad technique using a manual device, single patient use only. Sticker price is about between $37 and $40. The combination of the suction easy with the Ducanto catheter is called the Sea Duck. It's available in the United States at, at present. Um, in Europe, you can purchase the Suction Easy, and um, uh, I abdicate the uh, I uh, abdicate that you remove seven centimeters from the full length of a Suction Easy if you convert it into a Sea Duck. And I have some interest overseas due to the uh, meeting uh, last November in Amsterdam, the World Airway Management Meeting. So I'm going to begin by squeezing the bulb and releasing. Squeezing the bulb and releasing, and you can see the airway contaminant going into the bulb. And I'm going to try to make it so you can see it on the bag here. As you can see, I'm getting airway contaminant out of the mannequin. Now I'm going to slide my hand down the suction easy's bulb to the score decanto catheter, and I'm going to push and lift and place my laryngoscope. If I have a second assistant, that second assistant can operate the suction device for me, they can squeeze and release it. But if I'm alone, I can slide my hand back up and suction. I can perform the salad, uh, salad park, this device. And of course, 
salad poke. And I don't have a tracheal tube ready, so I'll quickly get one out. Use this new J stylet, which is really nifty. Salad poke, tracheal tube delivery. Tracheal tube delivery, there we go. I soiled my, soiled my lens a little bit, sorry about that. This is removed. So if any of you are going to the Grand Canyon, just to let you know, uh, the EMS or first responders for the Grand Canyon have adopted this uh, because it's, um, it's inexpensive and it works um, and it's easy to understand. Um, it is available through um, Boundary Medical and um, it's also uh, available through the manufacturer in um, Ohio. Uh, they're, uh, they're called EM Innovations. So at this point, I'm going to switch cameras here. Let's see here. And I'll just go back to my normal camera one moment. I see. So it's your switch camera. Very good. Okay. Move that away. Okay. Um, last few comments that I'd like to make. Uh, Bill, do we have any uh, questions um, through the? Uh... Yeah, Jim. We we do. Um, Margaret had uh, put in the chat window about the uh, the new J stylet that it looks yeah. a lot more flexible than the first glide scope stylet was then she wanted to know was that an illusion it appeared to be a lot easier to remove from the tube well it's built differently oh, can you hear me let me get this microphone a little bit closer here sorry about that guys um it's built a little bit it looks it handles very much the same way as a glide scope stylet it's actually single patient use um it's 15 dollars a piece i know that sounds like a lot of money but when you consider that the GlideScope stylet is not single patient use and there are 60, $70 and they get lost. Um, if you, this thing may be, um, I, I suggest you get a hold of uh, Sharn Anesthesia. Uh, they're selling these and I, I bought a case of uh, 10 for $110. I just went ahead and bought them. Let me hold this up to the screen. Um, this is the name of the device. Um, and uh, it's technically called the J Wand semi-rigid stylet and there's two versions one with a small flexible bougie type let me get it on here come here you flexible bougie thingy and one that looks just like a glide scope stylet what's ergonomically different about this device is it has little hand grips that are different from the glide scope stylet Where did you go? I lost him. The Glidescope stylet has a simple horn that projects uh, posteriorly. And if you know how to hold that horn, it's actually pretty easy to handle, uh, but a lot of people don't. This is really um, self-explanatory that you can put your index finger through here. You can control the stylet from up top. This little nozzle here is intended for an oxygen, a uh, low, oxygen one to four liters a minute that will interface to the 15 millimeter connector of the tracheal tube so you're blowing oxygen not through the stylet but through the tracheal tube that's safe if you're blowing it through here and you right main stem it you can it is possible to hurt a patient blowing um, oxygen through a bougie I've, I've, uh, um, I had experience doing that uh, with jet ventilation which is more extreme than just insufflating oxygen of course so the the removal portion when you've delivered the tube this is what's neat about this. What I can do is with my hand, my, my uh, middle finger interfaces with the 15 millimeter connector and allows my thumb to essentially push the tracheal tube deep, deeper into the patient while with retracting the uh, stylet. The stylet is inside the larynx as you're doing this. So it is a more secure tube. I think it's a more secure tube delivery um, scenario. That's what I think. I hope that answers your question. Okay, and um, 
We've got a gentleman asking about the purpose of shifting the suction to the left. Why not just keep it in the left from the beginning? As we put more and more things into the uh, the mouth, you you start to run out. You, you run, start to run out of room. You restrict your ability to deliver the tracheal tube. But if you push that suction to the left, uh, especially if you have a GI bleed where you really need to sump pump out the hypopharynx, you can now actually regain some space inside the or the oral pharynx hypopharynx with uh, shifting the laryngoscope ever more so slightly towards the midline towards the left, so that you can get the tracheal tube in. I want you to understand that. Um, uh, we have largely solved the problem of visualizing the larynx We're using video laryngoscopy. The next frontier is making sure you get the, the tracheal tube in on the first try um, or the uh, rate of complications begin to soar. It's in the literature. I don't, I'm not going to go over it. Um, this is a manner by which you're going to optimize your ability to get the tracheal tube in on the first try. Okay. Uh Bob wrote, um, put in the chat window, Bob loves a decanto, but not a big fan of the salad poke. And I'm just reading through, uh, doesn't see recommending the salad poke, use your left hand, manipulate the CMAC appropriately. The decanto originally on the uh, right is an indication you have enough room to pass a bougie then or an ET. Well, with a bougie, I think that um, potentially um, you're, um, you got a point with a bougie. But um, we're, we're American trained, uh, American born and trained. And I don't know what it is about this country that has this unnatural fascination with stylets. But if you're dealing with styleted tracheal tubes, you'd better create the room to get the tracheal tube in on the first try. That's all I can say. The other th comment I'd like to make about the salad poke is if you don't like the salad poke, think of it this way. Think of something called the salad pinch. In lieu of um, poking my finger down the side of the, the blade, the other thing to do is with your uh, pinch the blade so that you can move it subtly to the left. And so that if you need to put the blade deeper, you can use your pinch maneuver to push the blade in or retract it. It's very common for us all to um, over insert tra uh, laryngoscopes, um, especially in emergencies. So um, you're going to be using this maneuver to retract the laryngoscope. And then when you see the molecular, you can pinch the laryngoscope and push it in. It's an alternative to that salad poke. And I understand what you're talking about. The, uh, we're having a fairly vigorous discussion on the folks aren't really, they're, they're coming up with ideas for our next presentation. So it's oh, cool. looking at, instead of using the, uh, the green slime and things, steak and pizza is one of the biggies. I've got to vote for burritos and then Taco Bell and beer, which actually sounds probably better. Um, let's see. It's got to work through a, a pump uh, of some sort. Um, large, the, the urology, urologists use a thing called a Tumi syringe. Um, I've actually rigged that to put solid chunky thingies into a mannequin. That's on YouTube. I'm not sure if the video is still up because the guy who put the video up put a lot of uh, copyrighted music on, as a score for the movie. And um, Time Warner um, or Warner Brothers uh, jumped on it with both feet and pulled the video because of the music. <laughs> we have to do a better job. I think we're all going to have to learn how to hum or something like that instead of using uh, um, copyrighted music. So I've got uh, Grayson who has uh, posted that the, it's, a, it's kind of an off-use label, off-label use of the uh, decanto catheter. Uh, that we've talked about before. It's using it as a delivery device for a bougie. And he was wondering if you were going to do that, uh, would you suggest a adult or pediatric bougie? And that's from Grayson. Yeah, I think you have to use the materials available to you in all honesty. I, I've actually done this technique myself. Uh, I can't recommend it, it's off label. Um, uh, if you wanna use a pediatric bougie, maybe you'll feel a little bit better about it. But um, if it's, um, um, I, um, I, I'll leave it to you. I, I don't have a good answer for you. But if you want literature uh, support for doing this technique um, in the British, uh, I, forget if, I forgot if it's at the British Journal of Anesthesia or the journal Anesthesia, it's a British journal. 
there's a le uh, at least one letter to the editor describing the technique in the uh, anesthetist who performed the um, bougie insertion was using a pediatric bougie with a open tip Yankauer catheter. They were doing this to help them place um, uh, what are called microlaryngeal tubes. They're really, they're pediatric sized tracheal tubes with larger cuffs that we use for surgery, uh, for uh, ear, nose and throat otolaryngology surgery when you wanna put a really, really tiny tracheal tube in so that a uh, ENT can work on the larynx. And they're having difficulty getting these tracheal tubes in. Um, they, I guess they didn't have the stylets or they just wanted to use a bougie based technique, but um, uh, they were using the uh, open tip Yankauer to deliver the pediatric bougie. Um, I would say um, uh, there's not a good answer. You could probably use the adult bougie, but I think the the problem with a pediatric bougie is you're assuming you're you're not going to hurt the patient, but you're putting something of a smaller diameter with more with just as much force in there. Sounds like it's sharper, if you know what I mean. Got a uh, question from uh, Margaret. She's asking about the uh, J wand using that with either a Mac blade or is it specific to like the GlideScope hyperangulated? Um, I'm really uh, happy this thing finally came out on the market. I was actually trying to create something like that myself several years ago, but um, um, it, it's actually really kind of hard to get things, uh, projects like this done. I'm glad somebody did it. I think it was a nurse anesthetist who did this. Um, and it's a great idea that my one trepidation when I was trying to create this, because I actually created prototypes that look just like this using a GlideScope stylet as, as the format. My concern was um, how are you going to get this thing bound to the metal stylet? And the answer is that they, they, made it they made it work. They did a great job. I was concerned when I was trying to make my own prototypes that the thing was going to be too long versus uh, too short. And I made several different versions. And finally, I just let the project go. And here's the commercial version. I think that this thing's a, f a fabulous tool. I think it's a great idea. What you're going to have to understand while you're doing using this with either a GlideScope or with a CMAC is as you come around the base of the tongue you, and as you see it appear, slow down, slow down. And I want you to watch how my elbow delivers this. I'm going to push my elbow down, push my elbow down, push my elbow down. And look what happens to the tip of this device as I push my elbow down. Isn't that the strangest thing you've ever seen? I learned this technique from using something called a Shikani stylet and a Levitan stylet. Those were the gadgets, and I have a few of them here, but I'm not going to pull them out. Where you literally look through the hole and see out the other end of the stylet. The, the technique requires you to bend your elbow to bring it around the base of the tongue. I learned tube delivery from using optical stylets. And what I learned was that with a straight arm, goes in the pharynx, goes around the base, the tongue goes up and in. So the elbow comes down and the elbow pushes forward just a little bit. So you just have to learn to use the ergonomics of this. So what I'd like you to do, get yourself one of these things. You may be able to get one of them for free if you ask for it and practice in a mannequin, practice in the mannequin, slow down, slow down, slow down. Maybe even put a, your phone camera on yourself and watch. Don't watch the tube delivery in the mannequin, watch your body, watch your posture because foot position uh, your body position with regard to the patient can make a huge difference when you're doing these tube delivery maneuvers. For me, it looks completely natural because I've done it thousands of times. Hey, Jim. Uh, I've got a question here from Kenny. He was a, if we do not have the decanto catheter. Does the more traditional wide bore catheter still work, even though it is straighter and less curved? How effective is this in displacing the mandible? slash tongue inferiorly in this case. So likely you have the high D, I would assume. And um, uh, the, the uh, I would assume you have the high D because it's a very economical large bore catheter. Certainly it'll work, yes. Uh, the Ducanto is optimized to be able to use with uh, the newest generation hypercurve video laryngoscopes. If you guys are using a hypercurve video laryngoscope, well, you might want to consider getting a catheter that is was optimized for use with a hypercurve video laryngoscope. And if you're not using a Mac shaped laryngoscope, the uh, the high D is just dandy. Okay. Got a question from Craig on: uh, Would you be able to start and keep the suction on the left the entire time and start instead of starting on the right and moving to the left? You could if you 
didn't have any issues with tongue control. The, the procedure is devised for the purpose of giving you absolute complete and utter mastery of tongue control from the beginning to the end of the procedure. And um, the, why, the reason I talk about it like this is that um, if you want to get things done on the first try and things are really, really, really bad, you have to put your best foot forward. And that's why I'm keeping the catheter, uh, suction catheter on the right as I go in. Um, keeping it on the right because I'm using that as a huge tongue depressor. This is a great tongue depressor. Yankauer is not so much. They're, they're, they're not as wide and they, and they bend. This doesn't bend. Of course, you don't want to hurt the patient, but you can, you can put force to the tongue and jaw with this. Open the mouth, compress the tongue. Um, I've um, been able to handle some uh, really tremendous airways with that, with using the suction catheter as a huge tongue depressor. Got a uh, question now from Amber. Any advice for encountering the tracheal edema, short, wide neck, obese patient, and the ET tube goes in, about two thirds of the way and gets stuck. We ended up using a King airway with good oxygenation ventilation, but would love any tips from you. Yeah, this is really hard. No, okay, so for, um, I'm, I've learned from EMS professionals about this in addition to colleagues in emergency medicine like Richard Levitan, proper patient positioning is absolutely completely mandatory with facing a patient like this. You absolutely completely need to position them properly. Let me show you. I'm going to do my little, um, I, can everybody see me on the camera? I think they still can, right, Bill? They can see me. I'm going to do my imitate. I'm going to do my imitation of a turtle. If I'm truly, really big and you position me completely flat, my turtle in, you can't intubate this. So what, if you, if you let, if you properly position me and sit me up, my neck, my shoulders come down, my neck gets nice and long. And now you've got access to be able to do your airway management procedures. But if you're just finding them flat and you're leaving them that way while you're working on them, you're setting yourself up really for doing a crappy job. Um, I know I'm, but you know, I know I'm not the one that's out there dealing with these things, but there are strategies. Um, there isn't a really good commercial solution yet for positioning a patient in a ramped position. Um, my friend Bob Barracks out in Sun Prairie, Wisconsin, created his own ramping pillow out of blankets and tape, and they carry it in the ambulance. And the first thing they do is they do a, a pit crew team drill where when they're in simulation, they, um, they use a full body uh, re re uh, rescue Randy mannequin with an airway head. They position that rescue Randy on that ramp. Then they begin their procedures of, of basic life support. Um, of course, this is an ALS crew we're talking about, not a, not a first responding crew. But what Bob taught me is when the EMS uh, arrives on a scene, if they're in a, a place that has pillows and blankets, you can use the available materials from around um, the environment to properly position the patient. Um, now, part of that question had to do with the tube got in two thirds of the way. What I don't know is did you get the tube into the larynx or not? <laughs> I don't know because I, I don't know what to say. And I don't know if you're using a video laryngoscope or, or what you're using. Um, Amber, Amber made a follow-up comment. The black line was just outside the cord. Uh, she was using a 7.0 ET. Tried putting a bougie through it. Uh, the ET just didn't work. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So black line probably right about right about there. Well, forgive me. Bad camera. Right where my thumb is. Right above the cuff. This is a tremendously subtle recommendation, and it may work or it may not work. The reason it works where I uh, in my hands is I've done it all a lot, and uh, I'm not under the stress that you're under. But what you're describing is a problem in which um, the tip of the tracheal tube has gone into the thyroid cartilage, and likely the dang tip of the tube is hung up on, get this, probably the cricothyroid membrane. On the inside of that uh, airway, as you go from thyroid cartilage to the connection with the trachea, the cricothyroid membrane is palpable in on the interior, not palpable by your finger, palpable by your airway equipment. The way to fix it is to stabilize the tracheal tube. And this is, I'm not going to, I'm going to say something to you. This does not constitute medical advice. You have to practice this in cadavers or, or try to make it happen in a mannequin. You actually have to turn the tracheal tube if you can get the tip off of the cricothyroid membrane anteriorly, it'll follow the path of the trachea, 
posteriorly and down into the thorax. This is, I don't know if I'm helping you by telling you this, but I'm just telling you that that's really what the answer is. And this is really, really, really hard stuff. So you're here, you're stuck, it's not going. How are you going to get this done? The way you're gonna do it is you're gonna put all the force to the 15 millimeter connector. If you grab the tube and try to do this, it doesn't work. The only thing that's really got any purchase on the tracheal tube is the 15 millimeter connector. And here's the other thing that's gonna freak you out. If you leave this completely like baggy between the front and back end, it, the force doesn't go to the tip. You actually have to straighten the tracheal tube, almost make it completely taut in order to get it to turn. It's a tricky thing. Having had the bougie, if you had put the bougie in and then used the maneuver and subtly tried to advance the bougie as you turned it, then you've got more security. That's a tough and one. You made a follow up on it also. We had him ramped uh, with ear to sternal notch, good view, tip went past. Uh, <laughs> I think you hung up on the cricothyroid membrane with the, with the tracheal tube. Um, and um, it's another reason why um, in the, the future, the, the, in the third decade of the 21st century, leading with an airway catheter may be the way. You get my drift? Okay. Leading with an airway catheter. Because um, this thing will probably, I, I, can't, I don't know how this is going to interact with the cricothyroid membrane, but if it does interact with it, you'll know it. If it goes in and won't go any deeper, you say, oh, cricothyroid membrane. The answer then is to turn the thing laterally to get it off the cricothyroid membrane. Joel entered up, put a question, and you may have already answered it for Joel. Regarding foot positioning, what about the pre-hospital personnel who have their patients on the floor? How do we drop the elbow when patients on the floor? And I think you may have answered it with, with Bob's example of creating the ramp that he carries with him in the ambulance so that he can ramp those oh, patients. Position. Well, actually, I don't think I answered it at all. And here's the thing is uh, when I work um, in the operating room, uh, most physicians um, who do the airway management stand exactly at the head of the bed, at the head of the bed, like I did in this demonstration. What I actually do is I work from an angle. I work from almost at the 45 degree angle at the, uh, at, at, from where the side of the table joins the head of the table, I stand there. And what that allows me to do is reach out over the patient and do these kinds of maneuvers. I stand 5'7". Um, I'm not a very tall guy. And um, when I'm height challenged with a patient, I will use a step stool. One of my other tactics is to actually not stand at the head. I stand a bit off to the side, almost 45 degrees. Instead of at um, 12 o'clock on the table or 6, excuse me, 6 o'clock, I stand more at um, 7.30 by the angle of a clock. I stand off the side. That's how I overcome my height challenge and how I overcome the ergonomics of using these types of techniques. Got a uh, question from Kenny. He says, as we only have access to direct laryngoscopy, no VL, you suggest any modifications to the salad technique with VL in terms of positioning, airway manipulations, given that a lot of objects already in the airway. Um, so uh, if, if you can't get a view of the larynx with the salad, with the catheter salad parked, it, it would possibly be part of the answer to that. You're going to have to back the catheter out. Hopefully you can back it out enough that you can get the room to see the larynx and deliver the tube. That's about the only thing I can say. I don't have a lot of wisdom on that. I think we, um, I think, uh, we need to make sure that uh, everybody gets access to this kind of technology. If you're gonna be doing these life-saving procedures, I think um, there was a controversy about um, whether uh, video laryngoscopy was gonna replace um, direct laryngoscopy. Um, we were talking about this on FOMED and I think COVID-19 is going to uh, push us in the direction of universal adoption of VL. I realize it's an economic issue. That's the only thing holding us back. Um, we do have some lower cost options coming on the market this year. Um, and COVID-19 helped uh, the European uh, manufacturer in question. Um, they're going to launch this product soon. Um, and when, uh, when I get it, uh, maybe Bill and I will do another podcast just to show you the, uh, the device. It's pretty neat. All right. Uh, 
anybody else have any uh, more questions before we uh, close this down for the day? We've been going for a little over an hour now. Oh, this is fabulous. I'm glad everybody is so interested. My heavens, this is great. All right. Suggestion for future videos, Jim, is uh, can we submit one minute videos of our standard approach with the use of the decanto and you can, can you evaluate and offer advice? Certainly, absolutely. I think um, one of the things that we need to do um, within uh, open, uh, the full foam ed thing, the free open access medical education is um, I think if uh, an individual like myself can engage with uh, a group uh, all over the world, for heaven's sakes, um, it gives me an opportunity to continue to help you. And then also I learned something from how other people do things. I'm still learning. I'm 25 years into a career of anesthesia and I'm still learning about this. Um, uh, we, um, uh, next five, 10 years, um, maybe we can change the world together and make airway management easier. I'd be willing to uh, host if folks want to send in videos like that, I'd be happy to post them, create a, a place on the website where basically a, a blog where it's almost like what Steve Smith does with EKGs, put the, the uh, video up there, let people look at it, critique, and then, you know, come in, you can give expert consult. Um, I've got a question from, let's see, Joanne. Uh, what do you feel is best practice when removing the video learn, uh, laryngoscope device from the airway? after the cuff is inflated or once the tube is seen to pass the vocal cords? It's hard, hard for me to uh, answer because um, oftentimes we're using the video learning scope to further put a, uh, a gastric tube in. And I believe um, at least, um, uh, so it, it depends upon, uh, okay, so if I place the tube, can you take the scope out? Absolutely. If your intention is to blindly place the gastric tube, if you want to use the laryng video laryngoscope to place the gastric tube, then inflate the cuff, have a second assistant hold the laryngoscope for you so that now you have two hands. And so why this is important is that um, team training needs to happen so that you can take uh, maximal um, advantage of the device. Um, this thing can be used for tracheal intubation, the foreign body removal, placing a gastro tube, placing one of those Sing stack, stack and black Blakemore uh, tubes for GI bleeds. It can be used for a variety of things. Um, if you do team drills in which you are holding the laryngoscope, you deliver the tube, you say to your assistant, okay, here, you hold the handle now. The reason being is now that you have two hands, now you can do the, tra you can do the tracheal tube cuff inflation, the suction catheter passed down that tracheal tube, suctioned out and connected immediately to your ventilatory device, hopefully with the help of filter in today's day and age. Um, so um, uh, you put a quarter in me and you, this is what you got for that question is um, I, I actually in the operating room, I'll leave the video laryngoscope in and use to put the gastro tube in it. If I'm going in the mouth, of course, nasal pharyngeal, I take the thing out. I think it might be, if that's something I know in my practice, we haven't seen the, the number of EMS services that are dropping, you know, ET tubes with their intubations. Now, maybe that's a good discussion to have as far as using that. I mean, there are definitely benefits to doing that at the time of intubation. So, right. So, right. Absolutely. Uh, one practice that my colleague from Sun Prairie does, it's another off, you know, these are off label uses of the Ducanto catheter. Um, but um, one of the things that he'll do is I'm just going to use the bougie as a surrogate for the esophagus here. And I'm going to switch cameras here. Right. One of these days I'll get really good at this. Oh yeah. Switch camera, switching camera, wrong camera. There it is. Okay. All right. So one of the things that uh, my friend Bob does is once he's got that tracheal tube in and that suction is left salad parked, He'll actually take the gastric tube and he'll put it through the catheter. This is off label, by the way, um, but he does it. He puts it in and then he backs the Ducanto out and he places his gastric tube that way. I'm not recommending this as a um, standard. I'm simply saying that this is something that uh, uh, very smart people are doing and it's been tremendously fast and effective for them. It, uh, it looks like we've, I don't see any new questions. I, 
Last call for questions and No new well, questions. Been... Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I'm simply saying this has been, I, I've had a great time here, everybody. Uh, thanks for showing interest. Uh, thanks for showing my buddy Bill uh, interest in his medical education site. One last thing I want to show you before we go. We're using the Seven Sigma mannequin, but this is the affordable off the shelf salad mannequin by uh, NASCO. Uh, it's, um, you search for um, the salad um, simulator. It's a airway Larry head. It's inexpensive, very durable. If you're training new people, it's a great tool because it can take a lot of um, force. The, the airway Larry is mounted on a Pelican style case. You can see here, I'm going the wrong way. Yeah, Pelican style case. It's large enough to mount on a gurney the side hatch allows you to run the uh, esophageal um, airway contaminant hose out of the side, keep the case closed. And um, he's also airline carry-on compliant when you put the head inside the case. Or if you're really looking for a lot of laughs, keep the head on the case and carry that on the airline with you. Got uh, one question. Let me just find it here. Da, 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 da. Uh, Diane asked what the uh, bag suction device was called. That's the C duck. The C duck. It's my, the initials are S E A D U C. Uh, I named it. I, I don't know if I'm very good at naming things, but it stands for suction easy Ducanto catheter. Um, it's available through the Boundary Medical website as well as the EM Innovations website. Um, and uh, it's uh, unfortunately we haven't been able to get um, it European distribution yet. But if you're in uh, Europe and you want to use this product, there is a UK distributor of the Suction Easy product. I, um, I don't have the name of that company off the top of my head. I really apologize. Um, let me see if I can find it one second here. Um, let me see here. Let me go here to Spencer. Um, No, I don't have it right now. Um, but if anybody um, wants to know, please uh, text my friend Bill and I'll make sure that Bill gets you that information for European distribution. Well, I think that has to wrap it up, Jim. I think uh, I appreciate you uh, doing this. This was great. Uh, for the folks that were wondering, we will have this posted online in a number of places. Uh, we will keep you uh, in mind as far as for future. I've talked to Jim. I'm hoping there's a great little device he's got called the Oxalator that I think could, in the COVID environment, I think could help a lot of folks um, provide better care. And I think there's, we're going to be right. doing these uh, pretty, hopefully fairly regularly. I'll um, let's just simply say in the 21st century, we're bringing back face mask ventilation. We're going to do a better job at it. We'll explain later. All right. Thanks everybody for uh, Thank coming you. on and we will uh, we'll keep you guys in mind as we do future things. If you have any desire, if you have any ideas on present presentations around critical care airway, I mean, don't hesitate to, uh, to give me a shout. Awesome. You want to switch it back over to me, Jim, on the hosting side? Okay. Sounds good. Okay, let me see, where do I do that? Be on that uh, ask bar under more. Um, pause, share, new share, polling, stop video. More. If, you, if you click on my name on the uh, tab, the participants. Oh, okay. Oh. All right. Oh, right. Okay. Here we are. Um, we are going to make host, changing host. Back to you. All right. Let me, I'll put up the information for contact. So, Bill, this was, it went pretty well, eh? I definitely did. Let me, uh, I'm going to, 
break loose here. Sure. For everybody that's left on the online, that's uh, contact information for me. That's website. Feel free to follow me on Twitter. We will be uh, adding things like this again all through the future. All right. That was really nice. Some nice things. Uh, so I got um, nice chat.